Sergei Tabachnikov. I am a mathematician at Penn State University, and I'm a member of the scientific committee. And I chaired the committee that selected um, young researchers. So it's a great pleasure to meet you in person. Previously, I only saw the files. And welcome to the Tuesday morning session. Uh, we start with a panel discussion. Uh, the topic is future challenges in mathematics and computer science. And it's my pleasure to invite the moderator, Professor Ragni Pian, on the stage. Thank you, Sergey, and good morning, everybody, and welcome to this panel discussion. It is my pleasure to introduce the panel. Uh, first, I'll call on Eric Brewer to take the stage. <laughs> Eric Brewer is <coughs> the recipient of the ACM Prize in Computing in 2007 for his design and development of highly scalable internet services and innovations in bringing information technology to developing regions. He is a former professor at UC Berkeley and is now vice president of infrastructure at Google. He has his PhD, his undergraduate degree, I think, from Berkeley, from UC Berkeley, and his PhD from MIT. Please take your seat, Eric. Take a seat. Then I call on Alexei Efros to take the, come up on the stage. <clears throat> Alexei Efros received the ACM Prize in Computing in 2016 for groundbreaking data-driven approaches to computer graphics and computer vision. He's a professor at University of California, Berkeley. Alexei was born in Russia, but has his undergraduate degree from University of Utah and his PhD from UC Berkeley. <clears throat> then I invite Carlos Kenig to come up on the stage. <clears throat> Carlos Kenig is president of the International Mathematical Union. He's a professor at the University of Chicago. His research fields are linear and nonlinear partial differential equations and harmonic an analysis. Carlos was born in Argentina, but has his undergraduate and graduate education from University of Chicago. <clears throat> Next is Shigifu Mori. Please come on the stage. Shigifu Memori received the Fields Medal in 1990 for important developments in algebraic geometry, the Minimal Model Program, or Mori's program, in connection with the classification problem of algebraic varieties of dimension three. Shigifumi is a professor at Kyoto University, but has also had held various positions in the US at Harvard University, IAS, Princeton, Columbia, and University of Utah. Shigifumi was born in Japan and has his, I think, undergraduate and graduate degree from the University of Kyoto. And he's the former, he's now the past president of the International Mathematical Union. <clears throat> Last but not least, I call on Terry Pancake to take the stage. <clears throat> Terry Pancake is, <clears throat> was named a fellow of ACM in 2001 for leadership contributions to usability to high performance computing tools. She's a former president of the Association for Computing Machinery 2018 to 2020. <clears throat> She's the Professor Emeritus of Oregon, at Oregon State University and is the founder and now the director of the Northwest Alliance for Computational Science and Engineering. In addition to her <clears throat> PhD in computer science, uh, she <clears throat> has 
uh, also a degree in anthropology. And I should say that before doing her PhD in computer engineering at Auburn University, she spent 10 years in Guatemala, <coughs> and she was a museum curator. And you studied the Maya people, right? <laughs> we'll maybe hear more about that. OK, so that was the panel. <coughs> And the topic that the panel has been asked to address and discuss <coughs> is future challenges in mathematics and computer science. And I think this is a highly appropriate and relevant and suitable topic for the Heidelberg Laureate Forum. <coughs> the HLF is a unique event in that it brings together young people and not so young researchers <laughs> in mathematics and computer science. And the idea is now that <coughs> we should consider, or the panel should consider challenges, not math, only math specific or computer science specific, but try to focus on the interaction between mathematics and computer science. I mean, we're not here to discuss the millennium problems in mathematics. We're here to discuss to see more what is going on and what do you think will be going on with mathematics and computer their science in the future. And I think there are many interesting topics that will be raised and interesting questions and maybe agreements and disagreements. Uh, future could mean in 10 years, in 25 years, in 50 years. It's up to you. So let's now start uh, with, I will give each panelist about five minutes uh, time to, to answer what they think are the challenges in mathematics and computer science. And I'll start with Eric, please. All right, fantastic. Honored to be here. I will start a little bit with uh, cloud computing because that's kind of the, the dance that brought me here. The, uh, Cloud computing has one interesting thing, I think, that makes it particularly relevant here, which is the scale is so large that you don't think about the, the individual computers or the individual disks, right? You know, when we train undergrads in computer science, you say, oh, here's an operating system that runs on a machine. Here's how it works. By the way, assume it works perfectly, which for the most part it does, right? at least in terms of the hardware. I can't say so, as much for the software, which we'll get to in a minute. And then you take a million of those machines and you put them in racks and you give them uh, a network and then you say, okay, well, here's this giant supercomputer, use it as you like. The first time you used a supercomputer probably was when you did a web search, maybe in the 90s if you're old enough to have done one then, right? A web search is an interactive session with a supercomputer. You send it your query, it uses hundreds at the time, now thousands, arguably hundreds of thousands of machines to answer that query, right? That's a personal supercomputer that you get for a, a fraction of a second, right? And then it goes on to the next person. Um, but when you're dealing with a million machines, you would expect that a one in a million failure happens all the time, right? By definition. And so the way you think about the, the availability of that system, does it work or not? can't be with the assumption being that it's all going to work. In fact, you have to assume the opposite. You have to assume that at any given time, some fraction of the pieces will be broken, right? And so there's an, a fairly, uh, there's a lot of existing math around that. The, probably the prettiest is around storage. When you, something like YouTube gets uploaded, I don't know, I think it's about 400 hours of footage uh, I believe, per minute, <laughs> meaning that it's arriving faster than you can watch it. <laughs> you, you already can't watch what's on YouTube. It's not possible. But when you store exabytes of data, you can look up exa, but that's above peta, above tera, right? Lots of zeros. 
we're not going to store all that by having many copies of that data. That would be the naive way to store it. That's called mirroring, because you make a mirror copy of, of each thing. The way that's actually stored is by some beautiful math that has to do with encoding the pieces, so that with a small number of extra bits over the base amount, you get you can recover even in the presence of losses. So I'm not going to cover that math, but I think it's a good example of math that kind of saved us from having to store multiple copies of everything, which is frankly very expensive and probably unrealistic, to storing a little bit extra, but that extra is mathematically special and it means that we can recreate any lost part. So any disk failures, any rack, whole collection of disks fail, we can still recompute all the pieces of, the, of everything in YouTube, which is why to first order, you know, your, your photos on the cloud don't disappear. Right? Google's never lost data, and Google's not alone in that statement, because m many others use this approach. So generalizing that a little bit, I'd like to say I think there's still a big need in cloud computing for how do you do the, the equivalent of macroeconomics, right? where I want the macro view of everything going on. Right? You could think of that as maybe that's just statistics, but it's a, not a trivial statistics, because for example, in these cases, these are, not correl these are often correlated failures. So the easy case for statistics is you assume independent failure, IID, right? That's not true. And the math gets unfriendly when you throw away independence. In fact, it's something that you know, I don't personally know how to solve, although I think there's people in the room that can do a great job on that. But one general problem I'd point out is the macro view of systems needs help, right? How do we look at the broad collection of things, understand the aggregate behavior, even when the components are having various problems, and those problems include correlated failures? But I actually think that's not the most interesting thing. There's much more coming in this space, which is there is, uh, you know, not losing a photo, you can think of that as a safety property. It's something I want to promise to be true about the system. But there's much bigger safety properties I'd like us to work on, and they need help. <laughs> the one I'm working on quite a bit is security. So, for example, open source is a huge trend in computer science where the code used to write systems is free and publicly available, and that open source code is used in kind of everything you use. It's used in every cloud, it's used in every phone, it's now used in government services, including some that you care a lot about, like your electrical grid, or your water supply, or your oil pipeline. And the problem with having open source, or really any modern code in any of those systems, is it's probably not trustworthy, right? It is not worthy of the trust we already place in it, right? Now, how are we gonna fix that? So that is my current mission, is to fix the security of open source. But I want you to think about it as a safety property. It would be very nice if we could prove that this code is safe to use. And that we could prove that this code was built correctly and actually came from the source code that we think it came from. Right? How do we know that the code in a system is actually even what we intend it to be, number one, then if it is what we intend it to be, is that code actually doing what it's supposed to do? Right? We are not very good at making such statements. Now the good news is, and by the way, the part of that is because software is written in generally poor programming languages. I'm going to insult all the PL people for the moment. In the sense that they have mostly limited uh, safety properties. The classic ones that are in all over the place, C and C++, widely used. It's in the Linux operating system that's in everything underneath the cloud. Uh, that has no type safety and no memory safety. That basically means it's very easy for it to have uh, significant security problems. So there's lots of languages that are doing well in that space, uh, and they're all based on math. Right? There are functional languages based on monads. There's actually return of lambda calculus, if you can believe that, that's showing up in various ways. Uh, and I've even heard good arguments for non-Turing complete languages. Right? You kind of think, well, it's not Turing complete, it can't do much. That's not true. We actually have lots of existing non-Turing complete languages that are useful in their domain. Right? And because they are simpler, provably simpler, you can make stronger safety statements about them, including uh, recent work that shows we can actually have a language, I believe it's called COCA, which has uh, 
automatically generated reference counting as a way to give you memory safety. It actually generates C as its output that you can then run, but the C it generates has built in the reference checks to track memory, right? So I think this return of <laughs> lambda calculus and its ilk, by really which I mean programming languages derived in a very direct way from math, that is gonna be uh, maybe part of this answer to how do we fix the security of, of the whole world. You could say similar things for private, uh, privacy. We would also like to have provably safe privacy. That also has some beautiful math called differential privacy. That's the same kind of thing. I'd like to actually be able to give up some of my data in exchange for advertising perhaps, but not all of it. How do I personally make decisions about privacy trade-offs? That would be awesome, right? But I'll just stop there and say these are kinds of areas where I believe there's a huge room for math to make a great societal change. Right, the safety properties that we all already trust, but are not actually worthy of that trust. Thank you. I'll now ask, I'll now ask Carlos to, you can sit or stand as you want. Thank you. So uh, let me just start by saying that uh, I have no particular expertise in computer science. So uh, whatever comments I make are uh, strictly from the point of view of a mathematician and of a somewhat informed outsider to computer science, but really only somewhat. Um, Algorithms and computing have featured pro prominently in mathematics since antiquity, something that uh, we learn in primary school, the division algorithm, that's a prime example of that. Since the mid 20th century, scientific computing has greatly influenced the mathematics of partial differential equations, which is uh, of course, one of the things I've spent most of my time doing. Uh, my own work in the last 20 years uh, on the soliton resolution conjecture, which is a purely mathematical uh, construction and conjecture, has its origins in numerical experiments, which were carried out at Los Alamos in the 1940s, just at the end of World War II uh, by Fermi, Pasta, Ulam, and Singu when uh, Fermi uh, decided that there should be a good use for the big computer that was built at Los Alamos, which was called the Maniac, to be used in, uh, for scientific purposes. And uh, as far as I understand, this is a uh, the beginning of scientific computation, I mean, the, this uh, first uh, numerical experiment at Los Alamos. And uh, this kind of uh, application of scientific computing to partial differential equations has now become uh, somewhat uh, typical. And uh, we are now all very aware of the effect that mathematics and mathematics and computing have had in the spectacular development of the natural sciences in the late 20th century. And particularly, I'd like to point out a very influential book uh, written in 1960 by Eugene Wigner titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Mathematics in the Natural Sciences. This is a, a fantastic and prescient book which attracted the attention of many scientists and philosophers. Uh, so let me now uh, turn to uh, the connection with computer science. Uh, mathematicians continue to be very interested in modern computer science and in, in the mathematical problems that arise from it. We just heard a few. Uh, at the last uh, International Congress of Mathematicians, which is the quadrennial flagship event of the International Mathematical Union, which was held virtually this past July, four of the 21 plenary lectures were in topics related to computer science. 
Uh, the talks were given by Kevin Buzzard, the, who spoke about the rise of formalism in mathematics, which uh, was a very prov provocative lecture. Among other things, it raised the question of whether computers could prove all theorems and thus render mathematicians like myself, for example, obsolete, uh, which you know, theoretically is what happened with the games of chess and then the game of Go. Uh, fortunately, uh, Buzzard seemed to think that the quick answer is no, that there's still uh, work for us, uh, but uh, that the computers can be used uh, in actual proofs in a very useful and efficient ways. There was another talk uh, by Avi Wigderson, who's somewhere around here, uh, on symmetries, computation, and math. Can P not equal to NP be proven via gra a gradient descent? Uh, I won't comment on, on this lecture uh, because it's highly risky with uh, Avi being around. Okay, uh, the, the next talk was by Craig Gentry. Uh, its title was Homomorphic Encryption. And uh, this was a, a, a fascinating lecture uh, dealing with a, a breakthrough uh, in encryption which was obtained by pure thought. And uh, the, the thought process was so clear that he could explain it in a lecture. By the way, all these lectures are available in the IMU YouTube channel so they can be viewed freely by anybody. Uh, the, the next uh, uh, mathematics of computer science talk was Umesh Vazirani on the complexity of quantum many body systems. Uh, this was a very deep talk uh, and I have to say, uh, I confess that it went completely over my head, so I, I will not uh, comment on this. And then uh, the last uh, lecture that I want to mention was by Wayne and Earth. Uh, on a mathematical perspective on machine learning, and I'd like to spend a few minutes discussing what I uh, had to say about this. This is obviously a, a very timely topic. We will have discussion of this later on today. Um, so let me explain my superficial understanding of this uh, lecture by Wayne Anne on this very important and timely topic. Um, I posited that at the heart of machine learning, there is the problem of approximating functions in high dimensional spaces where you know the value in a finite number of points, which might be large. And this is the kind of problem that was mentioned already. And uh, from some points of view, this is a, a very classical topic in mathematical analysis in approximation theory treated by standard uh, methods in functional analysis and related fields. But the twist uh, in uh, the use of this in machine learning is what's being known as the curse of dimensionality, which I'm sure most of you know much better than me. And uh, uh, the problem is that the classical estimates uh, obtained by approximation theory uh, grow exponentially in the dimension. And uh, this makes this useless in machine learning applications. R now, what uh, X claims, uh, and I'm sure it's uh, quite justified, is that neural network-based machine learning models don't have this issue, this curse of dimension. And this is the reason for their success. So the, here, uh, some uh, interesting mathematical challenges immediately arise. One is to quantify this uh, application of neural networks mathematically and developing the corresponding mathematical network to prove this and uh, possibly find new applications and put machine learning based on neural networks on what mathematicians consider to be a logically sound basis. Uh, from my perspective, I would say that probably the perspective of most mathematicians, this is a very important area for future cooperation of math and computer science, and also a fantastic source of new mathematics 
to develop uh, solving problems that we wouldn't have thought of before. So I think this is a great challenge for mathematicians and, uh, and for the cooperation between mathematicians and computer scientists. Uh, maybe this idea of putting this on a completely logically sound basis uh, is somewhat irrelevant for the practitioners of machine learning. Uh, I have a daughter who studies social sciences and uses machine learning all the time. And when I try to talk to her about the logical foundations of machine learning, she has no time for me. So, <laughs> but uh, I think uh, people should be aware of the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, perhaps possible also in computing and data sciences. And I leave you with that. Thank you. <clears throat> I will now ask Alexei to give his views. Uh, good morning. I'm, I'm a computer scientist. I'm very humbled to be here surrounded by these mathematicians. I think we are kind of the, uh, you know, the baby brothers and sisters of, of mathematicians because mathematics has been around you know, since the beginning, to beginning of time. It will be around after all of us are gone. It's, it's eternal. Computer science, on the other hand, is um, you know, it's a very young baby field, and it's, it's always changing. It's continuing to change. You know, we, we now talk about program and programming, but maybe, you know, in 10 years or five years, we'll be, you know, instead of that, defining objectives and, and optimizing goals, right? Um, you know, right now, we still care about getting the right answer out of the computer, but, you know, the field of approximate computation is, 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 is uh, going strong. And, and for a lot of applications, like in machine learning, you really, you know, it's actually good if you get slightly different answer all the time and it's not quite the right answer, right? And all of your photos and videos stored on your phones, they're not stored perfectly, right? There is a lot of perceptual lossy compression that, that happens behind the scenes. So things, things are changing very, very fast. It's kind of like in medical school, you know, this idea of uh, half-life of knowledge. You know, at the graduation ceremony in medical school, the, the, the dean comes and says, remember graduates, in five years, half of what we tell you will turn, turn out to be false, right? That's just, you know, the progress of science. You know, things, things evolve, we, we know new things. So I think this half-life of knowledge in, in computer science is, is quite short, and machine learning, it's maybe like three months, okay? Um, and, and, and so, you know, computer science has always been in this kind of weird position, not quite science and not quite engineering, somewhere between, and I think that that kind of, um, there will be a decoupling in the future, and especially, I think, in the area of artificial intelligence. Uh, and it will go into kind of the, the science AI, what I call science AI and engineering AI. So engineering AI is basically all the cool users of machine learning, um, robo-receptionists, robo-lawyers, you know, self-driving cars, self-building houses, something to answer your email for you. Because, you know, frankly, 90% of our emails could totally be answered by, you know, GPT-3, you know, not to mention GPT-5, whatever, right? Uh, it's, all, it's all the same things, right? Um, and, and, and science AI, on the other hand, will, I think, go kind of closer to the natural sciences, uh, evolutionary biologies, um, development of psychology, uh, anthropology, maybe philosophy. Um, when I was uh, growing up in the 80s in the USSR and, you know, excited about science fiction and I was chatting with friends about the future and one of my friends told me a wonderful definition of AI that I think is still my favorite. He said, AI is not when computers can write poetry. AI is when the computer will want to write poetry. And that's, I think, the difference, definition, the difference between engineering AI and science AI, right? Uh, because, you know, GPT transformers can already write poetry. It's crappy poetry, but they can write it. Um, I'm sure they will be able to write your emails for you. They will be able to, you know, write some romance novels or maybe even a couple of Hollywood blockbusters. But, you know, is it going to produce the next Borges or the next Bach? I highly doubt this. Um, because the thing is that, um, it, it, you know, AI, uh, intelligence is not something that you can specify with an objective function. It's not something you optimize for. 
it's, it's, it's a byproduct, all right? It's an emergent property of, of grounding in our, in, our re, in our natural world and now basically in the, in the human condition. And it's, the, it's been evolving over billions of years of evolution. You can't just copy and paste it, right? You have to, you have to live it, you have to evolve it. And, and I think this is where uh, the, the challenge lies. How do we, you know, how do we figure out the processes, the mechanisms that govern this, this, this evolution and this, um, this emergence of intelligence in both um, biological agents and artificial agents? And I think this is, this is a fantastic challenge for, for, the, uh, for the future of AI and, um, and probably for all of computer science and perhaps mathematics as well. Thank you. And now I will ask Shigi Fumi. <clears throat> oh, can you hear me? Okay. So uh, when I was given this topic, uh, <laughs> I was at a loss. Uh, I didn't know what to say. But uh, I can interpret this uh, in two ways. Uh, future challenges in the, the interaction of math and computer science, or Future, uh, future challenges in mathematics and future challenges in computer science combined. And so uh, in the, the former uh, question, I, I appreciate the existence of this HLF. I, each time I come, I come to HLF, I can see uh, faces of computer scientists. Uh, in, in doing whatever, uh, uh, interactions, you must have the, the faces of the, the, the colleagues, and uh, this, this is a unique opportunity. Well, and having said that, I <laughs> I'll go to the second topic, what the, the future challenges in, in mathematics. So uh, in the development of AI, or in the, the, in the, as in the talk of Alexei, um, I wonder what essence in mathematics. And I think uh, it is uh, mathematical ideas. And I often uh, compare mathematical ideas to uh, uh, beauty in, in art or uh, art equivalent in other disciplines. I remember uh, 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 Heisuke Hironaka once he gave a uh, talk and he mentioned a uh, uh, Buckminster Fuller. He is a uh, uh, poet and in, uh, computer designist and uh, so, so many things. And uh, he said that uh, when uh, he do the designing, he never feels uh, art. But uh, after the work, if he cannot find uh, beauty, something must be wrong. And that's the way he looks at uh, beauty. And um, Andre Weil, he is a great mathematician in the 20th century. And he, he uh, around 1960, he came to Japan and uh, several young Japanese mathematicians asked him a question. What's mathematical ideas? And the uh, various answer is, uh, I cannot define it. But if I'm given a mathematical paper, I can find it. I mean, <laughs> sounds disappointing, but uh, it's true. And uh, another question, uh, how mathematical ideas to uh, come to a people? Well, uh, this answer is to people who can work without mathematical ideas. I mean, you, you may find it disappointing, but if you compare uh, Fuller's uh, answer uh, words and this answer, they are, are very similar in nature. So if you cannot find, uh, I mean, for, while doing the, the, the work, you don't just feel uh, art, but as a result, it must contain uh, beauty if it's a uh, good work. Yeah. So 
in that sense, art is not something, uh, art is uh, something you got as a resu result of the work, not something you sort of uh, aim at uh, before or feel during it. And so uh, it's not something you define. No, it's not something you, you can define. Yeah. So in this sense, uh, uh, it's, uh, it reminded me uh, of uh, uh, Alexei's talk. And so since you cannot define it, uh, it's not something uh, it can be replaced by AIs or other uh, machine language and, uh, and et cetera. Sorry, I stop here. <laughs> <laughs> Then I invite Cherry to <coughs> take the stand. So I'd like to start by asking you a couple of questions and I'd like you to raise your hands high so I can see them to see the results of uh, these, these questions. So think for a minute about what you think is your own challenge over the next 20 year period? What's a big challenge that you'd like to be involved in or that you think is particularly important for computing or math? So here's my first question. How many of them require that you work as part of a team in order to solve it? Raise your hand. Okay. Now, how many of those challenges, if you, it, does your challenge, is it going to require having data or methods or expertise from other disciplines come into play? Raise your hand. All right, lots of them. Now, here's the third question about it. How many of you think that for solving that problem, the methods, ideas, approaches of computing or math are required in order to solve that challenge. This is pretty universal from everybody who was raising their hands and this is what I want to say I think our big challenge is. Yes, we have lots of challenges in terms of the things we're going to be focusing on having to do with computing and math. But perhaps even more important is the challenge of learning to reach out and be a better partner with other disciplines in the future. Otherwise, what we're gonna find out, and we're already seeing this, is that other groups, whether we're talking about science or health professionals, or aerospace engineers, or chemistry factories. They think we provide tools, we provide methods, but they solve the problems, and we're not necessarily important to have at the table. And I think that's what the problem is now, is that we're really seen as a source of raw materials for them, but not necessarily as an equal player. And I think from the things my colleagues have been saying, and particularly these last comments that we heard about the notion of beauty in mathematics and in approaches, I think what we really have to bring to the table is not our software and not our tools and not our methods, but our way of looking at problems, our way of approaching them and coming to solutions, which is fundamentally different from the way an aerospace engineer or a biologist approaches problems, or an anthropologist for that matter. And that therefore what we need to do is be better at reaching out to the other disciplines. Right now they think we're just a bunch of geeks who provide the raw materials for them. We're the ones who have to step up and show them 
that we are bringing these fundamentally different ways of looking at the universe. In terms of computational science, it wasn't just about having computers available to do science. It was about thinking about the whole process in a different way. But now the computational scientists have taken it off and they're running with it and they think we'll provide their software, we'll provide their systems, we'll provide their data, we'll give them some new partial differential equation methods, but we don't need to be there for the discussions. And so I think, for me at least, the big challenge is how we step up and show that it's our approaches to things and our appreciation of different ways of looking at things that are the real fundamental contribution that computing and math have to offer as we go forward to solve some of these really existential challenges for mankind. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists for this uh, introduction to uh, <laughs> what we're discussing, and now to the discussion. So now I'll invite all of you to uh, just raise, give a little sign, and uh, <laughs> comments, questions. <laughs> Who wants to start? Oh. Eric? I always get to be first. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> it's Apparently a chosen last name. <laughs> well, I, I feel like there is, first there is a, a pretty wide variety of views here, so that's always a good way to start. And I hope we'll hear from the audience as well. But certainly I think there's kind of, I've come to understand you can talk about the, the kind of areas, like I suggest areas that I think where they can, work together. Alexis suggests areas where they might split apart. Uh, and, I, and then there's things about approaches or even beauty. And I think that that's a pretty diverse collection of ideas. I do wonder, you know, you know how do we actually even often state the problems that we want to solve. Because I feel like I'm talking about problems where I'd like things to be provably true. When I say safety property, what that means is you can prove that they're true, not just that they might be true. But a lot of times the, the first step of, of a proof is what exactly is the problem, right? Can you define it in a, can you define the problem itself in a rigorous way such that our mathematical and computer science thinking then applies? So I think there's, you know, in AI, there's lots of discussion of that exact topic, and I think there's less so, frankly, in other parts of computer science. Um, but I'd, I'd love to see us have a little discussion of, you know, how can we work together to define some of the problems we want to solve so that our, our collective methods might actually be applicable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody wants to comment on that? Uh, Carlos? Yeah. I I think that that's, uh, of course, a basic step, uh, but uh, how do we go about doing it is the problem, right? Uh, uh, I think in machine learning now, th there seems to be somewhat of a consensus about what are the problems that need to be solved. <laughs> Maybe I'm being overly optimistic. Yeah, I, I, I'm, yeah, I wouldn't go this way. I think I, I, this far, I think, I think there is a lot of things that people are doing because everybody else is doing it. Yeah. Those might not be the right problems, though. Yeah. Um, in, in particular, for example, you know, there is a, most of the field is doing what's called supervised learning, where you, know, you have your x's and you have your y's, and you're mapping your x's to your y's, you know, the, yeah. the data to your labels. But uh, some of us, and I think it's a growing club, believe that actually that's, that's, that's just going to create create these, these students who cram for the exam, you know, without having gone to lecture and, you know, me remembering these X, Y pairs, and they do well in the exam, of course. We know we all have students like that, right? But, you know, you don't know the material, right? Um, and so some of us have been pushing what's called self-supervised learning, where you don't get 
the whys or the whys get, you get from the data itself, not from the teacher. Um, and I think there is also, you know, there's, there's more things that it's, I think it's very, very unstable. I think, I think that this whole area is just moving so fast, so rapidly. You know, I've been traveling for a month and not paying attention to archive and already, you know, <laughs> five <laughs> things changed while I was away. I'd love to see us talk about the related problem of explainable AI, which is really machine learning tells us something is, is true and it maybe seemed to align with actual results in practice and then gives us an answer and we'd like to know why does it think that's the answer, right? And you know, one of the beautiful things about a proof is you can follow the steps. You can say, oh, this is true because steps lead to each other and they make sense. And I. You know, there are it's good work in explain way, but in general, the field, I think, is suffering from the fact that it gives you solutions that you can't understand or can't explain. Right. Yeah. Agreed, and also it opens the door to all the challenges then, I mean, a different kind of challenge. People who then say, well, yeah, the, your machine learning algorithms are coming up with this solution, but how do we know that that's not based on faulty learning data and, and by implicit biases in the process of how they're doing it. And so everything becomes sort of a battleground. But if it were explainable, we would at least have a, a step for discussing whether or not it's flawed. In, right now, it's just, I say it's flawed, you say it's not. I, I, I think there, there, is, there is an interesting, what I was arguing for is this kind of a drift of, of AI and machine learning towards, towards biological sciences. And I think this is a great example of this, that, I mean, we hope, we, we hope for explainability because in the best of what we have, mathematics, yeah. we can explain things. But the reality is that psychologists will tell us there is no such thing. Uh, there is this wonderful book, Thinking Fast and Thinking Slow, right? System two is all about interpreting what system one already decided and just making a pretty picture out of it, right? Um, the same thing, I think, is kind of happening in, in, in AI. A lot of the explainable AI, you know, you, fake, you make a decision first and then you make this scaffolding about how, how this, is, this decision makes sense, right? And this is, you know, this is evolutionarily, like, it makes sense. And, and it makes sense for problems where you, it's, they are very entropy-rich problems. Very high dimensional, very entropy-rich. We have that in other fields as well. In pharmaceuticals, for example, there is plenty of drugs that, that, that are approved, they're used, they help people. We have absolutely no idea why this works they work, like there is no explanation because the explanation is just very high dimensional. It's because, well, these high, you know, 500 proteins or whatever, they, they combine in just the right way to do just the right thing. So there is an explanation. It's just that the explanation is very high dimensional and for our, our little, you know, seven plus or minus two things that we can hold in our heads at the same time, it just, it's too complicated. Yeah. And it will always be too complicated. So I think this is, Maybe not, it's, it's, it's a problem, but it's a problem in more areas than we, we like to believe, I think. You know, I think maybe part of it is helping our, our own disciplines, but also other disciplines, get a handle on the fact, to get back to Eric's original example, that when you're dealing with any system that has a million or a billion components, some of them aren't gonna be working. And how do you get your handle around, it's not perfect, it cannot ever be perfect. How much imperfection is perfectly tolerable. At what point do we say, well, that's too much imperfection? So I think only mathematicians really ask for proofs. <laughs> 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 this is lawyers. What, uh, well, no, that's interpretation. I'm, uh, my partner's a lawyer, I know about that. <laughs> but mathematicians really ask for proofs. And now there is, you mentioned, Carlos, the computer. Uh, pr uh, proof assistants that's, yeah. that are being developed. It's Koch and Lean. And do you think this is going to, so that you could say this is a sort of 
computer science influence on the fundament, fundamentals of mathematics? Do you think it's going to change mathematics? Or do you think this is going to be only for, I mean, I'm, uh, well, I can let you answer. Yeah. <laughs> no, my, my feeling is that it will probably be another helper okay. to proving <laughs> theorems, but not, uh, I agree with you, but but not uh, uh, generate the ideas that yeah. need that are needed. I mean, this is... Because you sort of could imagine that instead of set theory, you use type theory, yeah. and you sort of change the fundamentals of mathematics, and this will open up for whatever. But uh, yeah. I, I agree with you. <laughs> Although it makes me nervous that they can win at Go. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, okay. Can I ask you one question? So you mentioned uh, by, by, by AI, is, uh, what you mean is different from a deep learning? No, I, I, I guess <laughs> AI is again a, a okay. weird term. Okay. You know, th it's, it's kind of a thing that, you know, AI is something that doesn't work yet. As soon as it works, it's not AI anymore, oh. right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, the current methods Kind of machine learning methods like deep learning transformers, you know, they, th those are those are the, the things that are currently, you know, popular. Uh -huh. Is that the last thing? Is that the end? Who knows? There might be, you know, yeah. tomorrow on archive somebody posts something else, you know. Okay, so then in my understanding, the deep learning uh, puts uh, 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 investigate things, and uh, uh, it has many layers. And uh, one layer below, you sort of uh, combine uh, many items on the upper level, one upper level. But then, uh, uh, to be honest, I have no idea how one can sort of uh, get a reasonable result by, by this. Somehow, surprisingly, it works. <laughs> I, I think nobody really knows. So, you know, you can ask, I think this afternoon, uh, Jan is going to yes. uh, talk about, yeah, uh, you know, maybe yeah. if, everybody, if anyone knows, it would be Jan or, 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 um, or, or Jeff, uh -huh. uh, you know, but I think really nobody really knows the theory. And I think it's a great challenge, perhaps for mathematicians. Uh, uh -huh. But also nobody really knows how this thing works. I, right, and I, right. I, I believe that there is an alignment between those challenges. I think those challenges are not, not separate anymore. Mm -hmm. um, they are, they, I think solving one might give us some hint about the other. That's why neuroscientists, uh, we have a, we have uh, a grant yeah. with neuroscientists. Neuroscientists are very interested in this. Right, right. Uh, psychologists are very interested in this. Um, um, there seemed to be some sort of like a, um, an emergent kind of group of disciplines that are seem to be in an alignment. Um, mm -hmm. but, but again, this is all changes so fast. Uh, I, I, by the way, I, I very much like what you said about, about um, kind of beauty and, and maybe uh, this idea of uh, creativity and, and, and beauty and, 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 you know, thinking and analogies is, is also something that, you know, we, we always talk about it, but we think about this in terms of this is kind of part of the art world. It's, it's kind of our, our way of being kind of like artists, but it might be that this is perhaps soon there will be time for this to be also an area of investigation for, for, for us it, because it's, <laughs> it's a fascinating, fascinating topic. And it's something that, that, I'm very interested in, and we, again, we have absolutely no clue uh -huh. about what, what, is, what, is, what is creativity, what is, what is art, what is beauty, and... I mean, yeah. Sometimes mathematical uh, ideas can be obtained by analogy in uh, something in existence, but uh, some come out totally, you know, out of nowhere. <laughs> yeah. I, I think uh, one thing that uh, I find troubling Yes, uh, you know, about a year ago, we saw these uh, pictures of black holes, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yesterday in the lecture, we saw similar kind of pictures. Uh, uh, and these pictures are obtained by combining different things, uh, different cameras in different parts of the planet, and then recombining them. And you recombine them using deep learning in some way, right? 
So how do we know we are seeing the picture? Or <laughs> how do we know that that's what's really there? Uh, this is something that personally troubles me. Maybe, maybe you mathematicians are lucky because for you there is something really there. There is some truth <laughs> that you can base yourself on. Right. I think for the rest of us, you know, it, it's Just not, like it's not clear. Else. You know, we could all be in simulation, yeah. but math will still be math. Right. That's the beauty of it, right? Physics could be all wrong, but math is still math. So this, you, you guys are our only kind of a tether to reality. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's even more scary. <laughs> so you think we see illustrations rather than the real thing? I mean, that's uh, when they show us these uh, pictures, they're beautiful. But <laughs> no, I, no, there is definitely some, there is something, there, yeah. there is some, uh, something about this that is, that is, um, that is, that, that, that is to some sense real, but the, the idea of, um, of, um, um, you know, Jan Kundring talks about the Umwelt, the, this, this, this idea that an organism can only perceive things that, that it's capable of, of acting on and interacting with. And, the, the, the rest of the space is completely in, in, impossible for it to know. So, you know, for us, for example, we are in four dimensions and yeah. all these other dimensions, we just, they don't exist to us, even though they're there. So in some way it is real, but it's, it's a subjective real. Like I, I work in computer vision and, you know, the reason why computers and humans still don't see eye to eye, so to speak, is because we just perceive things in a very different way. We humans perceive the world uh, informed by all of our experience from our childhood of seeing other things. So we don't just see things for the first time. We see them based on all the data we have seen since childhood. And the computer comes in tabula rasa and it's just a completely different world. Yeah. It's also worth pointing out that those black hole images and really all the James Webb images are colorized for human vision, right? right. They don't exactly. actually reflect <laughs> what things look like in any meaningful sense of color, right? right? They're beautiful yeah. because they're made to be yes. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. But they're made by humans in some yes. sense yeah. because... They're yeah. interpreted, <laughs> which is great. Yes. But mathematicians uh, make figures on paper and in their head and they think, I mean, it helps them. It helps us yeah, thinking, exactly. yeah. but it doesn't present, I mean, I do complex geometry most of the time, sometimes real geometry. And of course, the pictures are very different. <laughs> and complex geometry is very hard to actually draw right. once you get up uh, in dimension more than one. Yeah. So, uh, but, but still mathematicians have this, uh, you know, we figure, and, and also with these computer generated um, things, it's, it helps your imagination and it helps you think that you understand something and maybe you do and maybe you don't. And there could be false things also. But then the computers can check it if it's false. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so where do you think we go from here in 10 years, 25 years, even 50? Do you have any thoughts? Where will we be? It's very difficult to predict too, the future. Too hard to predict. Hmm? Too hard to predict. Right too now. hard to predict. You don't want to say anything. Does anybody want to say something? Alexei, you may have some ideas. Yes. I, I, I yeah, I, <laughs> I, I could predict. Look, what I'm interested in, what I want, will be doing is, is this what I call science AI, because that's yeah. what ex yeah. excites me the most. Mm -hmm. I think it's, you know, future, I, I have the number one question that all first or second year graduate students at conferences ask me is, what's going to be hot in two years? <laughs> and it's a, it's a silly question because it's, it's, a, it's a question that presupposes determinism. Yeah. Right? But, but of course, we all know that in two years, what's going to be hot is what, what those Thank students you. will do, <laughs> right? It, it's not determined. It's up to everyone. Like everyone who is working on something hopes that that will be the hot thing in, in right. two or five or 10 or 20 years. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, those views are divergent. And then whatever works out is the, is the truth. But I think, I think it's not. It's not predetermined, and it's it's you know it's kind of like evolution. Evolution is something you can go, go look back and see a pattern, but 
you cannot predict evolution going forward. It's, it's, that's, that's the beauty of it, right? It doesn't have an objective, so there is no way to, to push it forward. Um, and I think the same thing with, with, with the, you know, this, this first for knowledge. We just, we want to learn things and I'm gonna do my thing and see if it works out and everybody else is going to do their thing. And uh, um, I think it's, 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 you know, and it kind of goes back to this, you know, curiosity, curiosity and, and, and creativity. I think mm -hmm. as, as long as one, one works on something that they're curious about and they're doing it in a creative way, something we will we'll know more than we know now which is really the, the, the definition of science right i know what i hope will be possible in 10 <laughs> years okay right now one of the things we were talking about the multi-dimensionality of things and how limited we are as humans in in getting our heads around more than just a handful of dimensions at a time and one of the reasons so so my research center, we focus on data science. And one of the reasons that high performance computing is so useful and tool, analytical tools, is that they allow us to say, show me what these dimensions I can't think about. Show me a different slice of dimensions. And yes, do it in a picture with colors and maybe it'll be a pretty picture, but at least it lets me sort of try to look and think about things from a different dimension. But where I hope we're going is that in 10 years, I don't have to pose the question that the system is able to say, hey, here's a dimension you're not looking at and maybe you wanna take a look at it this way and so that it becomes more of a real partnership where it's helping feed my creativity by pointing out to me I should be looking at things in a way I haven't thought to question yet. Mm -hmm. yeah, beautiful. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I have a worry. <laughs> Uh, so uh, in that era, uh, human will be very, how to say, dull. So uh, I mean, when a computer comes out, uh, ability, human ability sort of goes down. And if computer becomes so, so... <laughs> oh, I'm saying the opposite. <laughs> You're a friend. <laughs> I think it's the opposite. opposite? <laughs> I think that we as humans we have this incredible potential for creativity, but we also, based on however we've been trained or what our life experiences are, we also have a limited vision. No matter, I mean, your vision may be really broad, but it's not infinite. And, and being able to work more in a partnership where some other, the whole approach of AI is fundamentally different from the way we look at things and think about them. And so I say what a partnership this could be to have some other approach helping me look at things in a new way. Just like right now, if I sit down with an astrophysicist and actually talk I get ideas, I'm never gonna be a black hole specialist. However, looking at how they study black holes gives me some ideas about, well, maybe I should start thinking in a slightly new way. It's a way of stimulating human creativity in new ways. I, the, the machine isn't gonna take over. We're different, we're so fundamentally different, I don't see that happening. Returning to my uh, goal of, of safety properties, I think it has a nice connection with some things you just said, which is, you know, tr trying to make software trustworthy is, is a social problem as much as it is a math or computer science problem. And so you need a lot of disciplines. Uh, you know, I've, the obvious ones are I meet with governments. I was actually supposed to meet with the UK government yesterday. That got canceled because of a certain funeral. Mm. Um, but the purpose of that meeting was the UK realizes that they have a huge dependence on, on software in their systems. And again, for security or privacy things, what we call safety properties, things you want to be true, 
that's not how we build them, <laughs> right? They're built out of best effort languages it, with best effort everything. And so that's great if you want to make something faster. It's a great approach if you want to make something incrementally better. It's not a great approach if you want something that's provably meets some property. And so there's a, we have to decide when do we care about these properties enough to actually take the mathematical approach. And I would argue that for something like, do I want to trust my water supply? I would say yes. Every country should want to trust its water supply. And we could maybe leave software out of it. Maybe that's one approach until we figure out how to do software better. That's not that likely because software makes so many things more efficient and adds new capabilities. And we, we actually want that velocity. It, you know, lots of you know, productivity gains, GDP gains come from that velocity. But to also say, well, we want that velocity and we want it to be safe, we're just not very good at that yet, right? And so that's a, that's a political problem, it's an educational problem, it's a choice problem. You, know, you have to be careful about when you want these properties because they're hard to get. And, and what would you give up for them? And the answer is, I don't think we know yet what people are willing to give up for, you know, you know maybe a little bit more expensive system or a little bit uh, fewer features is a classic one. But I think whatever the solution is going to be, it's going to take these other disciplines to actually make any progress, right? I can maybe argue why we need to have a mathematical approach and in, in that it's, you know, it's always been true for security, really, because security, anything that's best effort means there's holes for adversaries, right? Adversaries find your holes. That's what they do. Um, and if you want something that is, per, can work against adversaries, you need a pretty strong foundation. Right? And then you need people to understand why they want that foundation and, and, and literally vote for it, literally fund it, right? Lots of work for researchers to do to create it, right? And companies to deliver it. So it's, it's not going to be a quick process. And, but I think we're at stage one in this, which is awareness, right? <laughs> we have a problem. Uh, I'd like us to take it seriously. I think that's starting to happen. There was a U.S. the Biden executive order is a big deal. I've had discussions in Germany and, and on almost the UK. So I do feel like countries realize this is an issue they'll have to care about, but that doesn't mean solutions are, are particularly close yet. So lot, lots of opportunity for future young researchers. Yes, actually now I would like to suggest that we ask the audience and now I address the young researchers. If there are any questions, we could take maybe three questions from the audience and then you will each get the chance to before we, we close. So, are there microphones available? <laughs> well, let's let's ask the young people first, and then. Sorry. There are a few. There's a hand. Up okay. There. Yes, there's a hand. The one up. Yeah. Um, can can you hear me? Okay. Remove your mask while you're talking. Okay. Um, Yuri Matyasevich has been quoted saying in 20 years time um, mathematical journals will not accept any paper unless it is accompanied by a computer verified proof. So what are your thoughts on that? I'd like to know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think that's a conjecture. <laughs> <laughs> that assumes everything you want to prove is provable using such a system, which I think is unlikely even in 20 years. Yeah. It's not going to happen right now. <laughs> yeah. Do we see some other hands raised? On the left. On the left. Fourth row. Please. Yes, there. Back. Thank you. Hello, is it working? Okay, uh, thank you for the very interesting panel. Uh, I would like to start with Professor Alexi. Uh, I'm Polish and uh, I would like to thank you very much for your tiny pin and uh, uh, these tiny statements, official statements are really reassuring for a citizen of a country that takes part, active part in this conflict from day one and thank you very much for that. And the question I have for you all is, uh, I believe that future challenges in mathematics and computer science often require professional uh, ability to erase our minds, to come with the tabula rasa state, as you mentioned already. So do you have any insights how to do that efficiently? 
thank you. <laughs> Helps to be young. I'm serious, actually. <laughs> How to be, be back to being a baby, right? <laughs> well, I think there, you know, my son is 19, and uh, he was asking me about, he's a uh, sophomore in college, of a young computer scientist, um, and he's asking me about, you know, different programming languages, and he started to get into you know, Haskell and things that are fairly advanced, that are not taught in his college. And uh, some of the questions he's asking me are making me wonder, like, huh, no one's ever asked me that before. Now, he's asking because he doesn't have any baggage about how it's supposed to be. Right. So his question essentially was, why... Well, first it was about the Hilbert Hotel and why can you add more people infinitely to the hotel? And his point is, well, if adding a new guest requires even epsilon amount of time, then it would take infinite time to do that. And that shouldn't count, right? That that's, that's not an okay answer to that proof, right? The notion of time is missing. And I don't know if he's right or not, but I think if you took that assumption, you could prove that the Hilbert Hotel is not actually true because it's <laughs> not a step can't be done in finite time. Right? That ties into a bunch of these pro safety properties in the sense that, um, for example, one of the ways you make a non-Turing complete language is you, put a, you have bounded loops. So you can't have an infinite loop by definition, it'll run forever. Uh, but um, it turns out you can't have an infinite loop on a real computer either in the sense of if you're computing something, it, eventually like a, say a Taylor series, you don't need to go to all the terms. At some point, you have more terms than you have resolution in your number system, right? And if you're doing something that's recursive, you don't, can't run forever because you're out of memory before you get to the point of halting or not. So in practice, it's going to halt, especially if you include time or resources. And if we took that approach, what would that mean for what's possible language? And the answer is, I don't know. But my bigger point is, I didn't ask the question. So I had baggage that said, oh, it's not negotiable whether the Hilbert Hotel is true or not. Right. right. So use your carefully crafted lack of knowledge to your advantage to ask questions that we're not going to ask. Right. That is a great advantage you have. Okay, is there another one more question? There is one in the back, Hello. to the right. Can you raise your arm again? Hi. Yeah. Um, right? Is it working? Okay. Um, so, hello, thank you very much for your discussion. I think it was very interesting. Now, I have a question. Um, imagine there is a very difficult um, theoretical conjecture, like maybe mathematical one, and like you don't really know if it's true or if it's false. So but you could actually generate some data, theoretical data, that you could maybe feed into an AI or something like that, and then you could get some kind of intuition about whether that would be true or not, or to what extent it would be true. Um, have you seen anything like this or some work about this? Or do you think that this could be work in the future, like in uh, something between AI and a very theoretical mathematical question? Thank you. Yeah. Um. Well, I, I, I can say that uh, sort of uh, we have seen almost every day now versions of this done through co uh, computational mathematics uh, where you, let's say, you have a, a certain equation and you want to find properties of solutions, you simulate them on a computer and you look at what you get and that tells you what you need to prove or how to approach that and what you're doing uh, by your question is going one step further but this is a very natural process for the way mathematics is conducted in, in certain areas so this is something that's already being done in a way right? okay let's yeah there is one there and that will be the last from the audience and then Vince will get uh, <laughs> since he insists Thank you very much Hi. for um, the wonderful section. Um, actually, uh, a student in Nigeria, and uh, I, during my undergraduates, I studied uh, mathematics and computer science. So for my postgraduates, the courses I took, uh, due to the courses I took in mathematics during my undergraduates, I was able to follow up in courses dealing with algorithm and the likes. But my colleagues that studied maybe pure computer science had issues in uh, courses related to 
to mathematics. And um, I was at an advantage because of the combination I had during my undergraduate. So um, what will you advise? Uh, will uh, computer science, because the department, uh, I had my undergraduate, they've sub separated mathematics from computer science. So uh, will you advise that uh, computer science and, uh, math and uh, mathematics uh, courses remained together or separated? Thank you. I think mathematicians will ask uh, together. So what about the computer scientists? That's, it's, it's obvious, <laughs> yes. together. But, but what about for the computer about scientists? You guys? <laughs> I certainly don't have a problem with it. I actually both fields play a service role for all other fields. And exactly. that's actually yeah. the most important role we have for, for the universities, yeah. I would say. So it doesn't, doesn't bother me. Yeah. Vince? Yeah, the microphone, please. Thank you. It's uh, is it on? testing one, two, three. Okay, so it's Vince Cerf. Um, I'm thinking a little bit about what Eric was uh, saying about uh, scale. And so now I'm wondering about the mathematics of scale. Uh, instead of proving things, uh, you know, right or wrong, maybe bounds checking, proving that, uh, that there is an upper bound to the error rates uh, or lower bound or something like that becomes the kind of mathematics we have to do when we're operating at large scale. Uh, Eric, uh, you know that uh, one of the things we watch in our cloud-based systems is the rate at which errors occur, since we know they're going to occur, when they exceed a certain threshold, then we get worried uh, that we should do something about it. To, uh, beyond the natural uh, mechanisms for recovery, well, like you know, restarting something, a computation. So maybe there's a, a kind of mathematics of scale here that, uh, that we need to think about, which is different from absolute proof. I, I think there certainly is, and there's, there's a lot of depth to have in that discussion. Uh, for example, one of the problems with looking at aggregate things like I have disk errors, for example, and I can tell when I have too many um, or any kind of error in a computer system, but what you really would like is more fine grain than that. For example, maybe only this customer is seeing too many errors. And if you look at that, if you look at the whole system, it actually, because a lot of large numbers, looks perfectly fine. Right, so what I really want is find me segments, subsets of data that are out of whack, right? Two sigma off from what they should be for all possible subsets in some sense, right? And again, without assuming independence, right? Which makes things a lot harder, right? In general, we like things that are independent and we like things, you know, all of our tools tend to have assumptions and not handy. That one is queuing theory. Queuing theory is great for certain things, but it also assumes uh, infinite queues, right? Not true and not that useful actually because of that. So I feel like there's some, some missing tools yet to be developed for how to think about these systems with finite resources, correlated failures, and, and subsets of interest. It's kind of like anomaly detection for, for any anomaly of any system, right? So it's, I think it's kind of wide open to, to make these feel significantly better. Yeah. Okay, last question. Yes. Let's go. You have to turn it down. No. It's not down. Hello? Can you help? How many engineers can take turn it on? Hi. Okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, I cannot resist making a comment on the beauty of mathematics, okay? Because, of course, there are beautiful mathematics, nice theories in physics, but the question is what we need as computer scientists. And I, I should say that I, I had studied uh, electrical engineering. I, I was fascinated by physics, continuous mathematics. And when I started working with discrete mathematics, I was uh, really disappointed. So perhaps we need ugly mathematics that work well. And uh, 
I think that computer science focuses on uh, constructivity, okay? So we need to understand how we can build systems correct, and we need theory about that, just to say something about the safety issue you raised, okay? And perhaps we need other kind of mathematics. I don't know if uh, this mathematics can exist, but it should be mainly constructive, okay? Because, because of the nature of, of computer science. Seems Thank possible. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So now we have to, yeah, you want to comment before? I'd like to make one small okay. comment okay. Okay. Uh, relating to what our P Polish colleague said. Uh, I think uh, one fundamental thing that we all need to develop mathematics, computer science, and in general all human thought is the possibility of expressing ourselves freely, having uh, the opportunity to do our work without interference, and all things of that sort that uh, are now very much in danger, and we should work hard to maintain them. So, yeah, Alex said before, so now I, I just want to go through all of you for final remarks, so maybe you can wait with yours to, is that okay? Let's no, okay, let's, oh, okay. okay, do it, no, no. No, I'm go I was going to start here for a change. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. <laughs> I actually thought that was a, a great comment you made because underlying our assumption that we will be able to address these future challenges is the assumption that we will be able to <laughs> do our work, speak out, share our information, and interact across disciplines. And that is in some doubt today. Yes. Maybe that's our biggest challenge, our most immediate one. Yeah, yeah. Shiggy for me. Well, um, <coughs> so for me, uh, uh, exchange of ideas like this is really the, the, the best way to, to fight against uh, these challenges. Yes, okay. okay. Carlos, you want, no, you're, 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 yeah. okay, Alexei. So, yeah, I, 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 want to, I want to echo the same point that, that for, for science to progress, one has to have a liberal society because you need to have freedom of speech, you need to have freedom of thought, you need to have freedom of expression, freedom of travel. And, and this is, I think, so use normal to a lot of people in, in, in Europe that they don't give a second thought to it. I was born in the Soviet Union in a dictatorship and I know how, how bad that is and how, how it, it stops all functioning of society, including science. And I think right now we're, what we're observing, we're observing not just a war between Russia and Ukraine, we're observing a war between dictatorships and liberal democracy. And I feel that everybody should go out of their way to defend liberalism, defend freedoms from what is, is attacking them right now. And at this particular point, it's, it's my home country, unfortunately, Russia, I hope not for long, but uh, this is something that we all have to be very, very conscious of and, and, um, and understand because this is a threat to all of us scientists and, and human beings. Uh, that's hard to follow, but I'll, I'll try nonetheless. <laughs> well, you have to. <laughs> yes, the, uh, I'll, I'll say one thing. I've done a lot of work in, in developing countries, which is really an applied computer science for you know things like telemedicine and uh, various kinds of electrification and healthcare. And that comes from freedom of travel for starters. And certainly uh, it comes from having, you know, you know, being well off enough to be able to make that work when, you know, you can't cover things always on university funding. And so I've been very fortunate and I, I do appreciate that. But I also want to say in these various travels that, um, to the extent the projects went well, they went well because uh, they came with a certain optimism and hope. And that, you know, for the, the bottom billion or two billion people of the planet, the most important thing we can do for them is give them hope, right? That tomorrow will be better than today. And 
when I was able to, to kind of say, oh, here's a way to do telemedicine where you don't have to go to the city and give up three days of work that you can't afford to, to lose, and you can get eye care in your, your village. And yeah, yes, if you have glaucoma, you might have to go to the city, but then you'll know, right? And that meant people would actually get treatment because they wouldn't get treatment before. In fact, related story, we, uh, we would tell them, oh, you have a, uh, say you need a cataract surgery. Cataracts are a big problem because of indoor cooking in India. And you'd say, oh, you're, you qualify for a free cataract replacement. The hospital will pay for it. You just go to the hospital and they'll do it. And these are blind people and they wouldn't go, right? Or at least some fraction would not go. And we're like, well, why wouldn't you go to have vision? This vision or no, no vision. And the answer is they didn't really believe it. And the solution was not deep. The solution was give them a piece of paper that says they're entitled to the surgery. And even though they were entitled whether they had the paper or not, if you gave them the paper, they would go, right? And the paper really is about the tangible hope. It's that, ah, now I'm entitled, I deserve this, I can prove that I deserve it, and now I'll go. And those people went and they had their surgery and they got their vision back, right? But I would say math computer science has one great thing to offer for sure, which is hope for a better future. And I, I do believe that's, that's really what's gonna help our liberal democracy. With these words, I thank the panelists for their contributions and uh, the audience for coming and listening and asking questions. And now there is a coffee break, I think, or not yet. Is there a coffee break now? Okay, so there is a coffee break, so you can talk to the panelists and to each other and continue this discussion and uh, challenge the future. <laughs>